A figure appears in the shadows at the entrance of our cave, approaching slowly, steadily, till the fire's dim light illuminates its face in the darkness. Is it one of the tribe, or is it one of them? For our ancestors, the night was truly dark and full of terrors. A face close enough to looking human, but not quite close enough to look just like ours, has the distinct effect of causing fear and a deep-seated uneasiness in the average person alive today. But why do we experience this? Is there some dark evolutionary past encountering other human species that gave us this very good reason to be fearful of faces just like these? The term Uncanny Valley has become more widely known in recent times to describe this exact emotion we are overcome with when our brains process these faces and figures. A term coined by Professor Masahori Mori is a phenomenon that he encountered while creating these lifelike robot human faces. These faces seem to create a positive response from humans the more realistic they became until they very rapidly didn't. That point just before it looks almost human was the point at which a strong feeling of revulsion overtook the viewer and it no longer made the person viewing it have feelings of any empathy or endearment towards the face. These feelings of empathy and feelings of likeness restored if the robot became so close to being real that it was almost indistinguishable from that of a normal human, however, as now it was basically one of us. Where could such a significant emotional and sometimes even physical response come from? There are some other things that trigger humans' brains, and even our distant cousins' monkeys' brains, in just the same way and are very obviously deeply hardwired into our brains. The sight of snakes, spiders, and worms immediately cause these same feelings of fear and disgust, and for a very good reason. They are genetically coded into our brains through millions of years to keep us safe from these things. A shuddering thought is just how many of our ancestors fell victim to them and even were devoured by these creatures for this response to be so vital that we now all have it. Us, the descendants of those who had enough fear of these nightmarish creatures to stay well away from them, were the ones who survived. Our early ancestors were more prey than predator, frequently falling victim to large snakes that could consume them whole, and small ones that could kill them with a single bite. The human and monkey brain seems to be especially paranoid when encountering snake-shaped objects. And in the psychological tests, images of these creatures and even blurred shapes resembling them cause a massive stress response in primate brains. And we are no exception. This leads us back to our response to these other homo sapien looking creatures. Could this response be an adequate and indeed necessary response to keep us safe from something that looks like a homo sapiens but in fact is not one of us. Yes, absolutely. And the scene that you're imagining is probably not as dark as it should be. We have been encountering other human species for millions of years, and it's only now that it's just us left on this planet. We could even go as far as to say that for more than 90% of our history, we have been living alongside many other human species. Our ancestors encountered Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Denisovans, Neanderthals, Homo florensiensis, Paranthropus, an African ghost ancestor we know almost nothing about, and many, many more. A common misconception would be that we came from these species, and as Homo sapiens emerged, the last species was no more. But fascinatingly, our ancestors often lived alongside their more outdated version of humans in separate groups. An interesting example of this would be Homo erectus, which most other human species that we come to know as being similar to our own emerged from. 
So these species evolved from Homo erectus, but interestingly, Homo erectus often stuck around, staying on Earth and living alongside the species that evolved from it, which shows us this very complex and strange situation that our human species has encountered over millions of years. An interesting example of this the DNA of people in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. When scientists looked at their DNA, they found Denisovan DNA, which wasn't that surprising when they found it. But what was interesting about this DNA is that it had Homo erectus DNA in it as well. This means that Denisovans interbred with Homo erectus. Quite a strange relationship seeing as though Denisovans evolved from Homo erectus and then later on were able to breed with the same species that they evolved from. A mind-boggling exercise would be to try and imagine these relationships and interactions our ancestors had with each of these species and the plethora of situations arising from them. But fortunately you will have some of that done for you as we go over the likely scenarios that took place between our ancestors and these human species, and why we still have this fear mechanism when viewing near human faces. The Hunter in the Night. Territoriality between species that hunt the same prey and compete for dominance of the same area is nothing new to this planet, and we see it happening daily amongst most creatures alive today. Lions and hyenas are sworn enemies, very often taking the opportunity to kill the other's younglings when given the chance. For every one less of them, the more room there is for us to grow. Could the same amount of aggression be expected between two human species? Absolutely. We know Homo sapiens crossed the whole of the African continent quite quickly but suddenly stopped when reaching the Middle East, where Neanderthals lived, and did not move past that point for 100,000 years. Professor Nick Longridge put forward a fascinating theory that our ancestors were victims of brutal territorial clashes with Neanderthals in a war that lasted 100,000 years, which I, along with many of the scientific community, absolutely agree with. In fact, I take it a step further with this theory and put forward that we did the same with most other human species we encountered. Horrifying images of Australopithecus climbing down from trees and stealing babies in the night, reminiscent of how chimpanzees catch other primate species for consumption. Night raids by hordes of troll-like Homo hadaburgensis, wielding stone axes rampaging through our ancestors' camps, stealing food and brutalizing anyone in the way. Encounters with massive half-gorilla, half-human paranthropus beating lone stragglers to death in territorial aggression probably haunted the nightmares of our early ancestors in Africa. But it didn't stop there. Encountering several species as they left Africa, our ancestors most likely fought thousands of skirmishes and battles against Denisovans, Neanderthals, and many more human species we have yet to discover as they made their way across the world over thousands of years. A species truly forged in violence. These encounters were likely even more terrifying. After all, we have a lot of evidence that Neanderthals were cannibals. Could they have been hunting us for meat just like they had been eating each other? A muscular hulking creature with twice the strength of a modern human male and a structure designed for hand-to-hand -hand combat with giant Ice Age creatures. What hope had we? And speaking of Neanderthals, did you know that you are probably part Neanderthal yourself? Most humans alive today have between 1-4% to Neanderthal DNA. And if you'd like to see how much you have, allow me to introduce our sponsor for today, Tommy Gen. Wondering how much Neanderthal DNA you have? Tommy Gen has generously decided to give my viewers a 10% discount on their DNA tests. This is one of the few DNA tests that shows the amount of Neanderthal DNA you have. 
Being one of the most comprehensive DNA tests out there, they also offer tons of super interesting info relating to your genetic code and can tell you about your paternal and maternal haplogroups, as well as health, pharmacological and nutritional information unique to your DNA. Click the link below and use my coupon Archives of ECNI to get your 10% discount. Anyway, without further ado, let's get back to the video. Denisovans couldn't have been much more enjoyable to face either. Being giants in comparison to our species at the time, averaging a weight almost double our ancestors, descending from the mountains to chase us from their territories. And before anyone says that they were actually smaller than us, take a look at my video about Denisovans called Ice Giants of the Old World and tell me if you still really believe that. A not so alluring mate. But we do know for sure that this was not the only outcome with these species. And that we did in fact lay with these other human species occasionally and possibly even more than occasionally. This may have been a peaceful melding of two human groups, but definitely was also through females being captured and sexually forced. A nightmarish scene. But our ancestors did often have the opportunity and the choice to willingly procreate with these other human species through a variety of scenarios. At this point, sexual selection could ultimately decide the fate of these individuals' survival or lack thereof. The issue is that this was probably a very, very bad choice. Making another human species your choice of mate would most likely lead to sterile and infertile offspring. And that was if the interbreeding could even be successful at all, which the majority of the time was probably not the case. As we know, mixing two species is usually unsuccessful. We know that humans did in fact breed with Neanderthals and Denisovans and another ghost ancestor in Africa. We know this because you have some of their DNA inside of you right now while you watch this video about your ancestors. Though we have this DNA, it's likely that tiny amounts of DNA that you have in you is from just a few successful interbreedings that took place. Thousands of attempts failed along the way, and you are the lucky one that survived, that wasn't sterile, and could survive long enough to breed again. It has been theorized that many of these successful breeding events created first-generation offspring that were unhealthy and full of genetic problems. Additionally, being the only half Neanderthal child in your tribe would most likely result in being ostracized and excluded from the group, making your chances of survival much, much less. The point of human attraction is exactly that, the selection of good genes for your offspring. A bad choice of a mate was so severely punished by nature that we now have the software inborn in all of our brains from birth. We unknowingly search for strength, intelligence, fertility and health in our mate, and most cannot explain in a logical way why they like these features when selecting a sexual partner. Being naturally freaked out by other human species' faces curbed any feelings of attraction or lust, and it's likely that our ancestors were those who had those feelings and therefore chose other homo sapiens to breed with, most of the time at least ensuring their survival and reinforcing the uncanny valley effect even more. You are literally the result of the uncanny valley effect.